So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Luc Peus. I'm a European uh, certified clinical perfusionist. Uh, I've, I've worked as a perfusionist uh, for 19 years around the Brussels area. And uh, now I'm going to, uh, I'm trying to migrate to the US, uh, but with the new regulations, I think I'll have to wait for a bit for that. Um, thank you all for uh, in the invitation to, to uh, give this presentation. And I'm, I just want to say that you're really doing a great job. It's incredible what you're doing. So uh, congratulations on that. So my talk is going to be uh, about the fact if do we need a weaning checklist or not? Uh, this presentation was part of a webinar by the European Association for Cardiothoracic Anesthesia. They did a webinar on uh, on, on uh, difficult weaning of, of bypass, and they asked me to to give something about the non-technical skills needed to do that, and with an emphasis on the weaning checklist. So uh, I have no conflict of interest uh, regarding this presentation. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is a bit about uh, describe the non-technical skills of which the checklist is a, is a cognitive aid to to uh, perform these tech non-technical skills. Uh, the bit the, the pro and the cons of using a checklist. Uh, come to the question if you really need a checklist. I'm going to uh, go a bit through the literature on weaning checklists, which is uh, virtually non-existent. And then uh, we will discuss a proposal for a checklist and how to execute one if you if you ever uh, decide we need a weaning checklist. And hopefully we'll come to some uh, meaningful conclusions at the end. So non-technical skills. Um, as you all know, uh, cardiac surgery is a very complex and, and a little bit stressful environment, uh, which requires uh, not only a lot of knowledge and, and technical skills, and but also uh, experience and non-technical skills. And I have always, I've often described my job as 95% uh, of my job is to prevent the other 5% from happening. It's really all about uh, checking, uh, making sure that all the bad things that can happen will not happen. So, and the weaning phase of, of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, is exactly one of those phases where um, it's really uh, where all the bad stuff can happen. So that's why you need some non-technical skills like preparation. You have to be prepared to, uh, to know your intervention, know your patient, uh, know the condition of your patient and, and be sure that you have all the material that is there. Uh, Hopefully you have a, a team discussion uh, about the case that you will be doing and you have some protocols installed. Uh, it's all about communication, of course. It, it would be good to have a standardized communication pattern so that when it really uh, is necessary that, that surgeons and anesthesiologists and perfusionists uh, know that something is se seriously is going on and that you, that you need their attention. It's also about uh, speaking up, of course and leadership and, and to be able to discuss problems that evolve during the procedure and, uh, and communication goes two ways. So it's also respect and listening to each other. So it's sharing of information to be, to be, uh, to be short. It's of course it's teamwork. I, I, I will uh, say it this time the first time, but I'm going to uh, say it a few more times during this presentation. It's all about teamwork and leaving, leaving time to do something about the situation. And then briefing, debriefing is also very important. Uh, it gives you the, the, um, the, the skills and the opportunity to discuss problems that have uh, arisen. And it will give you the opportunity to do something about it in the future. And then I'm not going to go deeper into, but uh, there's something called safety too, which is more uh, an emphasis on appraisal and, and about not about who did something wrong or what went wrong, but uh, what went right and how was it, how were you able to prevent a, a problem. So if you're interested in that, I suggest you, you do some reading on that. It's very, very interesting. So non-technical skills are, are things that we need in our profession. Uh, and hopefully your surgeon and anesthesiologist also uh, is aware are aware of those. 
And a checklist is, is a cognitive aid that can help you to, to aid in non-certain in to aid in certain non-technical skills. And it's it requires these non-technical skills to, to execute a checklist in a in a proper manner. So it's a bit uh, two ways. And this presentation is about, of course, I am pro checklist. Uh, I'm not going to lie about it. Otherwise, I would probably not doing this uh, presentation. But they, you don't, just don't need to adopt it because we say it. Uh, a checklist is, is surrounded with a lot of controversy. And there's a lot of caveats and, and, and pitfalls that you need to take into account. So uh, the pros and cons of checklists. Um, why would you have to adopt a checklist or why shouldn't you do, uh, adopt a checklist? So if I've uh, listed them a little bit. Yes, you should, cho you should choose a che checklist. Excuse me. You should choose a checklist because they have proven to prevent uh, uh, bad, bad things from happening and they will improve your outcomes. And the, the, the WHO surgical checklist has, has proven that. Uh, it reduces, it reduces, excuse me, it reduces uh, the use of your memory, which can often fail. And the older we get, we, the more we, we fail it. Uh, so they are a form of cognitive aid. They reduce errors by making sure that all the uh, information that you need to uh, communicate is, is grouped together and all the tasks you have to do. They encourage you to, to stick to best practices and they, they can be made by uh, following guidelines. So you're sure that you're following guidelines or standards. And this way they will maximize your, the efficiency in which you do some tasks. And they free your mind of, uh, of, uh, as a practic practitioner so you can focus on, on your patient uh, later. Uh, finally, they make sure that that um, if you've made an error and you use a checklist, then you you will make sure that that error is catched and identified, and you will avoid to make it, and the, the consequences are mitigated. And finally, if you know that your that a checklist will come up to to come up bypass, uh, for example, then you know that you have to do certain things, and you will make sure that um that pacemaker is in the room as a nurse for example and it's working there's a there's a new battery in it so you you will get peer pressure because you know that in public there will be a checklist so it will it will uh, make sure that uh, certain tasks are, are done beforehand now other people will say no you you shouldn't use a checklist because there's a lot of literature that says well it's not um it's not uh, reducing mortality uh, or not reducing the number of complications. And there's a big study out about the uh, surgical safety checklist. It's, it was done in, in Canada, in the state of Ontario, and they didn't see a re uh, significant reduction in, in uh, the number of errors or, or, a, or a better mortality or a, less, less, uh, a reduction in mortality, excuse me. But what, what happened was that this was a, a obligatory uh, introduction of the checklist and not many people were, were uh, willing to, to use it or it was not used in a, in a sufficient manner. And so they were just ticking boxes and they were not really using the checklist how it should be. But that's a discussion that you have to make for yourself. Uh, some say that yeah, checklists are just a symptom if you have to use a checklist, it's really a symptom of a, of, a, of a system going bad and you need other structural changes. And that is true because the checklist is but a part of uh, quality improvement. But still, it's, it's, it's uh, very useful. As a, even if, you're, if your structure and your organization is well, then a checklist is, is nevertheless uh, very efficient. Some checklists are needlessly complex and, and too long. And they, that will lead uh, to uh, checklist fatigue, as they say. Uh, like, I'm tired of these checklists. We always uh, have to do them. And, and many people, and, and we have to, to uh, admit that uh, sometimes they can be distracting and, and interfere with uh, key responsibilities that you have at that time. Like you're busy with something and they're waiting for the checklist. Uh, but it's all a matter of respect, of course.
And we have to admit, gaming the system is universal. We see it now with the, with the crisis around the coronavirus. Like some people just want to get around with it. And um, some providers will say, well, I'm, I'm protected by the system, so I don't have to pay much attention. And uh, they, will, they will be unwilling to, to participate in, in the use of a checklist. And then to conclude the, the, the contrast, it's, it's very important that people uh, get feedback about what they're doing. So you should install a system that, that makes sure that uh, by the introduction of a checklist, you have really improved the, the outcome. And there was just a, um, a study that came out uh, from Holland. And they are very into safety. And it was the introduction of a, of a very short checklist that only took two minutes before the, the patient was already asleep. And just before they started to do the operation, it's in cardiac surgery, they did a little checklist based on the, on the echo, echocardiography of the patient. And this way they could really reduce mortality and uh, the, it was the 120 day mortality. They could slice it in, in one third of what they had. And that was simply because by doing the echocardiography, they would change the, the cannulation site or the cannulation altogether, or they would go off pump. And this way they really reduced the number of complications and mortality. And if you can produce such results, then people will be more likely to, to uh, follow a checklist or follow the introduction of a checklist. Okay. So if you think about it, the, the big question that everyone has to ask themselves, or at least as a team, you should ask yourself is, do we actually need a weaning checklist? Um, and this is something you have to ask uh, in your own center and has to be discussed by, by the whole team, not just the surgeon saying, oh, we need a checklist to wean, because you always forget that protomine should be ready, and it's every day that we use protomine, so why is it not ready? Let's introduce a checklist. If you don't do it as a team, then there will be a lot of uh, resistance. So let's say you can ask as a team, ask that question, do you need a checklist? And let's say the answer is no, uh, we're doing pretty good. There's not much that we are missing. Uh, we take 90% of our patients off the pump without problems. Uh, so then great job, congratulations. But are you really um, honest about it? Uh, are you sure you measure everything that you miss? And uh, are you honest with yourself and towards your patient? Or are you, maybe it is, you say no because you wait for the right opportunity. Maybe there is always that surgeon that doesn't want to waste time because he wants to have his lunch on time and he doesn't, he will resist uh, introducing a checklist. Or you could say, yes, our team needs a checklist because every day we forget to have a pacemaker because it's still on ICU and you already, the perfusionist already goes to half flow and our uh, anesthesiologist is still uh, playing patients on his, uh, on his cell phone. So we have to, we have to look at that. Um, we have to introduce a checklist. So if you decide to do that, then you have to do some research about uh, how a checklist should work. Uh, the pros and the, the caveats of a checklist and then you develop a checklist which is very difficult because uh, you have to decide which items go on i will go uh, i will um, talk about that later <coughs> excuse me then when you've developed the checklist you should test it um, train it with the whole team uh, educate the people that that will be involved in the checklist and then evaluate uh, when you've introduced it, evaluate if the checklist is actually making a difference. So, and as I said again, as I've said before, I will say it again, you always have to do it as a team. So it's very important that everyone uh, can decide to, to think it's important. Okay, so before introducing a checklist, read the literature on checklists. There's a whole lot. Um, there's whole books written about checklists and there's many examples also about weaning. Um, and there's even manuals online that you can see from the from uh, government uh, institutions that decide what makes a good checklist. That it 
uh, what are the features of a, of a well-designed checklist. You can consider a checklist as a, as a little briefing or do briefings about the use of a checklist. And it's all about creating a share, what they call a, uh, a shared mental model. That means that every, every member of the team knows uh, what kind of patient you're dealing it with and what kind of what uh, what is the goal of this patient you know everyone wants to get them off of the bypass of course but how are we going to do it and what are the steps that need to be taken and uh, by considering a checklist as a briefing you can you can really uh, make sure that everyone goes to, for the same goal okay and as i said before uh, checklists are only one of the many uh, actions that are needed uh, to really enhance the, the the quality of the care to your patients. Um, just like guidelines are only uh, a part of it, uh, or or the technical skills are also only a part of it. It's all uh, grouped together, as we've seen in the in the previous uh, presentations by Sean. It's it's all a uh, integration of all the of all the different uh, aspects. Okay, so let's let's take a look at the, the weaning checklist in the literature. Um, there's a, a whole lot of literature on checklists in general, as I've said, but on weaning checklists, there you really have to dig in. You have to like more like read tutorials or reviews about uh, weaning patients from bypass, and often they will offer uh, a small list of items that you that you have to look for when you're going to wean your patient. And I can say that they are more or less all the same because yes, everybody knows you should have oxygen on, uh, that you should have your ventilation on, uh, on your ventilator before uh, you, you start uh, decreasing your flow. Everybody knows that prolamine should be ready and a cell saver should be standby and you know the pace basicator should be checked and the patient should be warm. Uh, so, it's it's not that difficult to to group the items uh, that that are there, but what is very important is the order in which you put them. But I'll talk about that later. The problem with the literature is that there is almost no research research on the effect of the clinical impl implementation of a, of a checklist. So it's some say that it might never be proven that the introduction of a weaning checklist. Uh, will really um, improve the quality of care to your patients or will improve uh, mortality figures or the, the reduction of complications. So that's a very, very difficult um, research that, that you should do. So, uh, and, but nevertheless, uh, I, was, I was involved in, in writing the the European guidelines on cardiopulmonary bypass that have been uh, introduced in 2019. And there we have a proposal uh, of a checklist and we also have a recommendation about the use of it. And I will talk about that uh, later. Of course, uh, there's many examples of checklists in the literature, but of course they should be adapted to, to your local needs. Okay, if you never give calcium on to patients on bypass, then you don't have to introduce it in your checklist, of course. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that would lead to uh, checklist fatigue. Okay. There is one, one article that I found about uh, weaning checklists, uh, which I would like to dig deeper into. Uh, so this, is, uh, um, this was uh, published in the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia in 2014 and it describes how they uh, first of all uh, developed a checklist using a Delphi process I will explain that later and then uh, they they checked if the use of a, of a checklist really uh, improved the way they uh, they go they come from bypass and this was in a simulation environment so what they did was they made a checklist using a Delphi process in fact, it's, it's a group of researchers that would decide on a number of topics that should be in a checklist. Uh, this goes out to all the researchers. They make some kind of a preliminary list. Then there is some voting on which one are the most important. And 
it, this goes back, the results go back to all the researchers, and then they vote again. And using this process a, a couple of times, like three or four times, then you come up with a with a, a final checklist uh, or a final result of, of whatever you try to decide. And here they came up with nine tasks that should be created, that should be uh, used when uh, coming of bypass. Nine tasks that should be uh, that should be accomplished. And then they took ten residents, uh, anesthesia residents, and they participated in 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 the simulation scenario, four different scenarios. And they first did it with without a checklist, and then with a checklist. So first, just from memory, uh, they had to retain nine items that they had to uh, speak out loud before they could go on with the weaning checklist. And there was an observer who would uh, check, who would cross out uh, any items that were missed or that were not uh, called out. And so, and then they got a paper with the actual checklist, and then they could read out loud and. Uh, and, and use the checklist before weaning. And you, of course, not surprisingly, if you have a paper in front of you, uh, the, the results were that if you didn't use a checklist, there were only four tasks completed in at least 75% of the times. And surprisingly, uh, eight tasks were completed at, 70, at least 70% of the time when they could use a checklist. But it's not 100%, which is another surprise, but I will come to that later. But uh, so there was a, a significant improvement in the completion of five of the nine items only. And so the conclusion were that, uh, that using a checklist is, uh, will, will augment the frequency of completing tasks and it will reduce uh, the omission of errors during a complex period. It's not too surprising, but still, um, what, what is surprising, uh, yeah, what is surprising is that, um, so here are the nine items that they had to read out. So, and this is without a checklist, so by heart, from their head, and this is with a checklist. And this is the frequency in, in number of times. So this is uh, on 40. So for example, calcium ready uh, without a checklist, uh, 36 times out of 40, so 90%, it was called out and it wasn't missed. And with the checklist, it was 39 times out of 40. Now, what is surprising is that, um, excuse me, of all the items, even with a checklist, even with a paper with all the items on it, there was only one item that was called out for 100% of the time, which is really surprising to me because you have it written before your nose and you still miss items. So. Surprising. And then the ventilator on, which, which was item number five, was called out 37 times out of 40. And then even with a checklist, it was called out less times than, um, than without a checklist. So even with a paper, there were uh, people forgetting it. And then reaching normothermia, which is something the perfusions has to take care of, uh, is only uh, called out without a checklist 11 times and even with a checklist only about half of the time or 60 percent of the time it was only called out so it's really something that 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 strikes me as as, as very strange and also the authors uh, mentioned that so even using it so that that's uh, proving that even if you have a checklist you have to use it in a proper way or else your results will be will be bad Okay, so that's why uh, we we thought it was useful to to uh, have an item on it in the in the guidelines and called cardiopulmonary bypass and else cardiac surgery. This is uh, freely uh, available online. I will just emphasize on on the on that part. So we had a whole chapter on separation from cardiopulmonary bypass, and uh, in there there was a a bit on a, on the weaning checklist. And our, since there is no uh, evidence, so it's a level C, that means that either there is uh, only case reports or it is a consensus of the, of the people writing the guidelines. 
Um, so there was no evidence. So the level is C, but the classification is one, which is a, a high classification because it's something you should do or it's recommended to do. It's uh, using a checklist before the weaning process. It's recommended to enhance the team performance and augment patient safety. So um, that is that is that was the. So we did a literature review, but we we couldn't find any literature. But we still thought it was important to have a weaning checklist uh, available because of the evidence that other checklists. Uh, uh, help you in, in team performance and, and patient safety. Okay, so we, we did not only uh, do a checklist, but we also uh, proposed a checklist. We, do, we did not only a recommendation, but we also proposed a weaning checklist. And you can see, I'm not going to go over everything, but you know, you check your blood gases, is the patient or is everything within limits? Uh, how is your filling uh, status, status of the patient? Uh, the cardiac assessment must have been done by the by the anesthesiologist through echo and 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 the surgeon can help you um, what's very important is the order of the uh, of the items and we just uh, try to make it logical but you can adapt it of course uh, one of our um, comments on this checklist was that you first you only ask if the patient is warmed at the end of the of the checklist while if he's not warmed yet, then you should put it in, in front of the checklist so you can already do the other items on the checklist. But, you know, it's it's not always easy to, to find the right order. Um, and this is only a proposal. It's, uh, it's to help perfusionists, to give a tool to perfusionists and to adapt it to their local needs. Uh, yeah, that's what I just said. Uh, we didn't add any values. Like, for example, we didn't say how much the hematocrit or hemoglobin should be or the ionograms, ion electrolytes or ions in, in the patient. We didn't give a, a, a reperfusion time. Uh, does it need to be 20 minutes uh, at a minimum? Does it need to be an hour? We didn't say it. We didn't say how much the patient should be warmed. Uh, that's all to, to decide in, in, a, in a local fashion. And so, as I said before, the layout and the order of the items is important. The layout, by that I mean, is it easily readable for a perfusionist? Uh, is it easy, or not not a perfusionist, but for the person who has to read out the items? Is it very readable? Is it logical? And and so the usability of the of the checklist is very important. And. Once again, I'm going to emphasize some emphasis on the uh, put the emphasis on the teamwork uh, that that everyone should be should be listening and and be respectful to to give time to people to execute if things weren't in order. And then what's very important, and I'm I'm glad that we we added this that at the end of the checklist, and this this is really at the end. Uh, there should be agreement by every team member, which is a surgeon, anesthesiologist, and perfusionist, that the patient can be weaned. There should be a, a quick uh, round, to like, uh, is everyone okay with weaning this patient? And everyone agrees, and then you can start the weaning process. So I'm, I'm really glad that that was uh, added to this, uh, to this uh, checklist. Um, Okay, so let's say you, you've, you've decided to use a checklist, you've uh, made one, we're going to train it, how should we do it? Well, it's a team effort, so you should pick one lead. Anesthesiologists are going to say, it has to be me, and perfusionists might say, I will do it, and surgeons will say, I don't care who does it, I just want to get a bypass. Uh, but um, it's, in, it's important that it's always the same person, perfusionist or, uh, or anesthesiologist. If you really cannot agree upon, then maybe the, the scrub nurse or the, the circulating nurse should read it. Uh, it's not really important who does it. But it requires a timeout. So everybody should uh, have the, the f be so friendly to shut up for a few minutes or a few seconds even to, uh, to do the checklist. It should be short, concise, but very clear. 
so it should be read out loud and the and the item should be crossed out um and in the beginning maybe a checklist can take uh one or two minutes but i'm pretty sure that in 90 percent of the cases your pay your pay your checklist will only last for 20 or 30 seconds just reading out and getting an answer and the more people do it the more they will understand that this can be very short uh, short as i said the order of the items is important you have to allow for a speak up like and, and respect when something is wrong if the temperature isn't reached and uh, then then you should uh, respect that then the surgeon should respect it or uh, the anesthesiologist and, and allow for the patient to warm up and as that call and check out all the boxes and and put uh, a checklist should you should be a part of the patient's uh, file a uh, medical record. Uh, just a few words about checklists in the future and and weaning uh, in the future. So the technology will will as as Sean has has pointed out uh, in the previous talk, there will be more communication between machines, and it's it's only normal with and and with all the te technology we have now. That should be that will be coming soon, I guess. I think within this and the next ten years, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and cardiac surgery in a whole, as a whole will look very differently. Uh, there are heart lung machines now that which which have a DMS data management system that have integrated checklists not only uh, for weaning but also for uh, quick um, uh, troubleshooting. And, and there's a new generation of heart lung machines that now have weaning modules and use artificial intelligence in fact to, to look at the patient's uh, condition and, and start weaning. So this is a, a, a recent a publication from JECT from last year uh, where they established a, a communication between the ventilator and the, the bypass. And it was very uh, basic and rudimentary so it was just that when your flow was zero and the breathing on the on the ventilator was also zero, then the machine gave an alarm, the computer gave an alarm. And you might say, well, that's that's really stupid to wait till it's zero. But it was just a, an, a kind of exercise to see if it was possible. And I'm sure that um, in the future that our heart-lung machines will have the communication directly with the ventilator and before you turn off that that knob to 75 percent of the of the flow that your uh heart lung machine is saying are you weaning or are you just you know going lower on flow for the surgeon because you know we have no we have no ventilation and you are going down on flow and i'm sure that that will happen in the future so this is an example of a checklist on on, on the newer heart lung machines uh, if you detect cerebral con congestion, let's say your uh, your CVD goes up and your uh, your uh, cerebral oximetry goes down, then you might suggest that you have a cerebral congestion and you have to check your venous line or uh, say that the surgeon didn't do a good uh, job with his cannula, or maybe check or maybe consider the use of uh, vacuum assisted venous drainage. You know, and then you can check all these items and say, I've done something about it or the problem is solved. And, and this would uh, give us more power to say that we have done something about the problem behind the back of the surgeon, even without uh, having to, to interfere with his uh, work. And then nowadays, the, the newer pumps have, are all run by apps and there are patient weaning modules. So you basically, I don't know really how it works because i've never worked with one but i i can i know that it's really i i've heard that it's really fancy and that uh, the machine takes care of uh, weaning and clamping and, and making sure your level stays uh, at the at the right spot and so it it looks promising and it's but we all have to take care or we have to be vigilant that we are not training a new generation of, of perfusionists uh like if you are a student and you are trained with a machine that has a a weaning, uh, a weaning device on it, and then you come in another center, and then they say, "Okay, we're going to wean this patient," uh, and the the perfusionist will not know what to do because he's used to having a machine doing that for him. 
So we have to be wary of that. I'm not against new technology, but we have to be careful uh, about how to use it. Uh, I can I can expect that in 90 to 95 percent of the of the patients, this weaning device will work perfectly. But that in in the five of ten or ten other percent of other patients, we will have to need the skills and and, and experience of a perfusionist. So uh, with that, I will leave you with some take-home messages. Uh, so first of all, the question is, do you really need a winning checklist? In our center, do we need it? And this should be in agreement with, with all uh, stakeholders. Uh, this will solve a lot of your uh, resistance problems if, you, if this is a, a mutual decision. If you decide on yes, then you should do the research, do, take your time to develop it to test it and educate it with, a, with the whole team and then train and evaluate it. And once again, there I go, it's teamwork. And I think that's uh, something you can use always uh, in cardiac surgery. Thank you very much.